Hello everybody, today we're going to look at how we might incorporate or use the Web API Request pi Pipeline. And so we'll talk a little bit about what that is and then we'll show you how to build it, uh, build in some features. So um, one of the common things that we want to do is um, things like authenticate um, users before they can get to any of our endpoints in REST. And so this is a way to do that and many other things. So let's just look at how this works. First of all, you should understand that, that um, REST just uses standard HTTP. And what that means is that we have a web server out there and we have a web client, which is a browser, but could be another application. It doesn't have to be a browser. And an HTTP request is sent to the web server. And that web server then responds with a response. So this is the basic architecture of how we communicate across the web over HTTP. So how does that work in a web API controller? Well we have a web server, we have the web API controller, and in that controller we have a bunch of controller actions or different controller actions that can be invoked. You can think of those as the endpoints that you're trying to get to. The request comes in, and then is routed to the right action and then the response goes back. So it's the same basic architecture, the only difference is, is how it's handled once it gets to the server and how the response is formed. So, so let's look at what the pipeline is then. So we have this request that comes in and we have a response that goes out from our controller we have already looked at a message handler and the message handler can basically intercept the request and look at it before it ever gets all the way into our controller code and determine if it should go ahead and pass it on and that's how we locked our application down using the API key and we have a video on that that you can watch on how to implement that. There's also authentication filters and we're going to talk about that today and how we would add that so the idea behind this is we want to actually look for a user ID and password or a token or something like that that would be coming in. And again, we could just um, keep that from getting all the way into our endpoint code uh, with this filter. There's also action filters. And action filters can be applied either at the request level or the response level, which is really um, interesting. So if if we have something that we want to have happen on every request, we can write an action filter. If we want to have something that happens on every response, we can write an action filter and catch things either way there. This is useful, for example, if you needed to modify the response for some reason or check it for some reason. There's also an exception filter. So any exception that comes out of our controller can be thrown to an exception filter and then we can handle that as a certain way. So that's a way to get kind of some, some kind of standard error handling and error response coming back out of our application. So why do we need this? Well, there's what's called cross-cutting concerns. So think of cross-cutting concerns as something that we always want to do no matter what happens. So for example, regardless of what endpoint we call, regardless of whether it's a post or a get or a put, we always want to make sure that the user is authenticated. Now again, we did this through a message handler and the API key, but we're going to go ahead and do that with a, a user ID and password check today. So things that we need applied for some or all actions. Now I want to point out that this doesn't mean that the filter can only work across everything. You can, you can create things in such a way that the filter only works on certain um, certain of the controller actions or uh, certain requests or verbs that come in you can make it so that that's the only thing that invokes the uh, the action or the filter sorry so some examples uh, for this are authentication authorization logging is a really big one and general error handling those are kind of the common ones that we see this used for out there so for logging, for example, maybe you want to log every time a request comes in and every time a response goes out. We could use an action filter for that. We're going to work with authentication today and show you how to do that. It's really simple to do. So, All right, so this is what we're going to build. Uh, we're going to build this authentication filter piece right here. 
And so that's what we want to look at. We've already, as I said, we've already looked at the message handler, and there is a video out there. I'll put a link in that in the video that you can see that. That's the API check, but here's the URL if you want to go look at it. But we're going to focus today on the authentication filter. And so here's what we're going to do, basically, and I'm going to walk through this, but we're going to create a new class for your filter that inherits from System Web HTTP, HTTP Filters Action Filter Attribute. We're going to then, in that code, we're going to check for an authorization header. We're going to get the user ID and password from the header and check it. And then we'll return a 401 if they're not authorized. And in our controller class, in order to wire this up, all we have to do is just decorate the class with the authentication class name you created to perform the authentication. And I'll demonstrate how to do that here in just a minute. Um, so if the class is authentication filter, it might look like this. There's the decoration. Now this decoration applies to the entire class, the entire controller class. So if you wanted to do this on individual methods in the class, then you can drop the authentication down into those areas. Okay, so we'll do that. We'll switch to that. We'll get out of our presentation here. Okay, so to start with, what we're going to do is create our new um, filter class. And to do that, we will simply right-click here and select. I'm using Visual Studio 2015. 2017 is out now. I'm going to be switching to that soon, but I want to use this uh, for now. So we're going to add a new class. And I am going to call this Authentication Filter. It doesn't matter what you name it. It can be named whatever, but I'm going to pick that. And then in this class, we're going to make sure that it inherits from system.web.http.filters.actionfilterattribute. So that's what we want a subclass from. And then we'll go ahead and do the implementation in here. So what we want to do is have an override for the... on action executing event and that sorry boy that's really okay so on action executing Make sure that this HTTP action context comes from system.web.http.controllers. So we've got that built. So the first thing we want to do is see if we have an authentication header. HTTP supports an authentication header. It's a standard header that's pat that we encode the user. We can encode information in. In this case, we'll encode the user ID and password, and we'll send that through. Um, and so we're going to check to see if that header exists. Because if the header doesn't exist, there's no point in trying to check for a user ID and password because it won't be there. So the very first thing we'll do is simply do, so we'll say if action content, context, request, headers, authorization, if that's a null, then what we want to do is form a response on the context and we're going to create a new system we're going to create a new response basically system.net We want a response message, so we're going to create a new one of those. And we're going to, with in its constructor, uh, 
pass a unauthorized. So that basically just creates a new response um, with an unauthorized or a 401, and then that will get sent back. Okay, if we do have a header, then we want to actually pull information out of the header. So So for example, if we have an authentication token, we can get that from the action context request headers authorization parameter. So that's our token, our decoded token. We got to decode this thing. Is going to be oops. I need to add a using up here for this. So I'm going to say using system text for some encoding decoding capability I need that so again I added this right here system.txt and right here what we want to do is do try this again and there's our encoding UTF-8 get string so this says go get me the data from the authentication token. So we are then going to convert that to from a base64 character from a base64 string. And what we're converting is the authentication token. So essentially what this is going to do is give me back a decoded token. So it will do the base64 decoding. Everything's base64 encoding as it's sent. So our username is going to be the decoded token. And we'll do substring. So basically what you've got here is you've got the user ID and password separated by a colon. And so what this is going to do is pull out the first thing, which is the user name. And in this case, we'll just look past that by one position. Okay, so that'll be our user ID and our password that we pass through. Okay, all right, so that's, that's, the, that's it. That's all we have to do to implement this uh, um, to create the, the class and the class implementation. So now we need to decorate our controller class with the decoration for that filter that we just built. And again, this is name dependent, so it depends on what you named your filter or named your class, your filter class. So we called it authentication filter. You'll notice that it knows about it and that's all there is to it. So let's go ahead and run this. So what we'll test for first is no header. That's our first logic that we have. Now, you may have noticed that we didn't actually implement anything to check the user ID and password. I'm going to leave that up to you as to how you want to do that. I may add a little code to do it, but um, if we go 
get, try to get information right now with no header, we get an unauthorized. So we need to add a header. And so what we're going to do is set the author, set a username and password. So let's say that it is, our username is Jack, and our password is Jones. If you wanted to see what that is, we can set that. So now it has encoded and created a basic authorization um, header for us. If I send it now, it's going to work. Now, it didn't actually check the user ID and password. It just worked. And so next, we're going to go ahead and put a check in. So let's do this. Let's go to our filter. And we can do this. Let's stop this. So this is where you might go and look up the, what, whatever the user passed in in your database or however you're going to go and get the user ID and password, whatever that is. I'm going to hard code it. So if username is equal to Jack and user password is equal to Jones, So actually, let's do it this way. Let's say if it's not equal to that, or it's not equal. Yeah. Let's do this. So that is authorized. You don't need to do anything necessarily there unless you wanted to log that they just logged in or something like that. And here we're not we're not authorized, right? So let's what we'll do is we'll just grab this same code here. And again, a better idea would be to reuse to create a uh, some kind of a reusable component so you're not having to create these over and over again. But we'll do a not authorized there. Okay, so there's Jack Jones is what it's looking for for the user ID and password. So let's go ahead and run this again. So if we edit this, you'll notice that Jack and J Jack Jones is what we've got set right now. If I send this in, we authorize. Okay, so let's change the password to Jack Jones with an extra S on it and set that and then send that in and I get an unauthorized. So now we've secured this through the authorization header using the filter for authentication. We'll go through a few more videos on some of these other actions, but you can see that it was very, very simple to add this. And so um, at a minimum, you want to make sure that you've got authentication usually on applications that you build. And so uh, that's it for this time. We'll continue on with uh, some, a few other examples for the action filters and the exception filter on how you might implement those. Thanks for watching.